A very good evening and welcome to the Marianne Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Xuan Yeo and I'm one of the two Ath Fellows this year. Fang Lizhi was a Chinese activist whose liberal ideas inspired the pro-democracy student movement of 1986 to 1987, and finally the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989. This eventually led to his exile from China. However, before Fang became a dissident, he was an idealistic communist who believed in the party. Our speaker tonight will discuss Fang's recently published autobiography, which shows how science, not political theory, caused this transformation. Professor Perry Link is Chancellorial Chair for Teaching Across Disciplines at the University of California, Riverside, and Professor Emeritus of East Asian Studies at Princeton University. He has written or edited 20 books and numerous articles on modern Chinese language, literature, popular culture, intellectual history, and politics. Known as one of the West's leading experts on China, its language, culture, and people, the Chinese government has banned him from travel to China since 1995. A multidisciplinarian at heart, he embraces teaching and research topics across a variety of disciplines. He finds the recent tendency towards specialization in the humanities and social sciences as potentially worrisome. Professor Ling's Athenaeum talk this evening is made possible by CMC's Gould Center for Humanistic Studies Goloman Lecture Fund. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Professor Perry Ling. Thank you so much, Yongxuan. I understand in Mandarin, that's your name. That's wonderful. And as soon as I get my notes out here, we can start. I'm very pleased to be here in this lovely room and on this lovely campus. And to introduce to you a very lovely human being, Fang Lijer, whose image you see here uh, is a wonderful man. Uh, my topic is, Does Science Imply Human Rights? The Intellectual Journey of the Dissident Chinese Astrophysicist Fang Lijie. <clears throat> and I salute everyone for coming to hear this topic instead of watching the Hillary Bernie debate that's going on at the same time, or preparing your taxes, which are due tomorrow. Um, what I want to do is two things. Uh, I thought it would be fun to share with you the way I got to know him in a series of stories and then do a more academic kind of analysis of how human rights and democratic ideals for him grew out of science. So I want to start with the stories. I met him in fall of 1988 when I was uh, working in Beijing uh, as the director of a group called the Committee on Scholarly Communication with the People's Republic of China, which is a subcommittee of the National Academy of Sciences, but handled scholarly exchange in all fields, not just in sciences. And at the Mid-Autumn Festival, I was invited to the home of a woman named Zhang Hanzhi, who is, was the widow of Chiao Guanhua, who was an important Chinese diplomat, and she, Zhang Hanzhi, herself knew English well enough to have been Chairman Mao's English tutor. So this was very charming, and she lived in an old uh, <coughs> um, uh, Beijing-style sty courtyard in, in, in the city. And Fang showed up with his spouse. My first impressions of him were how ordinary how plain he was. Because I'd known other famous dissidents, Liu Binyan, who looks like Abram Lincoln and speaks that way, more or less. And after all, he was a high-ranking Communist Party official at the time. He had been the vice president of the University of Science and Technology of China, which is a big deal. He was one of China's best scientists. So I was expecting someone who was moderately stuffy. Right? He wasn't stuffy at all. Hi, I'm Fang. Shake hands. No, as we say in Chinese, jia zi. No, 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 no shell to break through. Uh, and he was quiet for most of the evening as we sat in that courtyard. What I remember most clearly was how he laughed. 
he didn't say much, but every now and then <laughs> just this ebullient laughter would come out of him at, about some joke someone had cracked or some ironic situation. That's how I met him. <clears throat> I saw him a couple of times just in routine work between that event and the spring of 89, but the first time anything politically interesting came along was <clears throat> January 6th, 1989, when he decided, out of the blue, to write a letter to Deng Xiaoping, the top leader at the time, um, asking for a general amnesty for political prisoners, including, by name, Wei Jingsheng, who was still in prison, who had been in prison for about a decade from his activity at the Democracy Wall in 1979. So he called me up and <clears throat> said, I have something to show you. Can you come? So I rode a bicycle, rode up to his place, and he gave me this letter. And he said, will you please send this to the National Academy of Sciences? You can be my, my uh, conduit to the outside scholarly world. There were no photocopying machines at the time, so he copied this letter three times by hand. One he put an eight fun stamp on and put in the, in the mailbox to Mr. Deng Xiaoping. Uh, one he gave to me and one he gave to one of his friends who was in journalism. As soon as I heard the journalism comment, I said, would you like me to translate this and share it with Western journalists? Oh yes, that would be good, so I did and it went out and therefore became very quickly a public letter, not just a private letter, which is what he wanted actually. Um, the next time I met him was February 25th of that same year uh, when we were both at a conference. I can't even remember exactly what we were talking about at the conference, uh, but at the end of it, um, in just small talk, it turned out that he said he's going the next night to President H. W. George H. W. Bush's banquet. Uh, H. W. Bush, uh, George H. W. Bush at the time was um, a new president. He'd worked in China before. He wanted to make a good impression. And so he was gonna throw this big Texas-style barbecue at the Great Wall Hotel. And Fong had gotten an invitation, and so had I. And, wearing my little cap in scholarly exchange. So I said very casually, well, why don't we share a car? Because I had an office car. And he said, good, let's share a car. So next day, I picked them up with my wife and, and the two of them. We got in the car. And on the way to the Great Wall Hotel, about four blocks shy, were blocked. This bevy of plainclothes police just came out and blocked the way and surrounded us. And he said, OK, if we're blocked, we're going to walk. So we got out and started to walk. And they immediately took him and his wife off to one side where I couldn't hear them. Uh, my wife and I couldn't hear them. And they just said to us, you know, uh, wait a minute. And he's not really invited and so on. And then he came back and said, they told me I'm not invited. So why don't we go to the US Embassy to check whether we're really invited or not? So we went to a nearby hotel and got in another taxi. And about four blocks down the road, oh, bevy of plainclothes police come out and block the road again. So defective tail light. The first time around it was for speeding. Even though we were in a traffic jam, it was speeding. Uh, so the defective tail light stopped us again and we hop out and he's always practical. He said, let's go by bus. So we lined up at this bus stop and there were about two dozen other ordinary Chinese waiting there. And the bus starts to approach and we can see it hailed down and the, somebody goes and says something to the driver and when the driver comes to the bus stop, it just drives by. And then it happened again on the next bus, just drove by. And the ordinary people are shouting, you know, and they wanted to go home, and what's going on? And I won't repeat everything they said, some of it's a bit obscene. Um, but then Fong turned to me and he said, you know, we're the problem here. And it's not fair to these ordinary people that they can't get on a bus. Let's walk. So we didn't have our winter coats, and it was February, but we did. We traipsed for two and a half hours through the cold night over to the gate of the US Embassy, accompanied all the while by police on motorcycles and plainclothes police on foot and so on. And we get to one uh, <clears throat> intersection, and this phalanx would drop back while the next one takes over. There must have been three or 400 police assigned to him that night. We finally get there, and the gate is 
closed and it's also guarded by police and soldiers and so we were at our uh, wits end until a Canadian diplomat by chance came along uh, and well, as soon as he heard this is Fang Liger, he knew who Fang Liger was and this was something to help with. So he invited us to his apartment and we got to the gate of the apartment and the police were all there in their motorcycles and so on and the guard says, who is your guest? And the Canadian diplomat started to say all kinds of uh, international, some of you are IR students, right? Uh, IR verbiage about the privileges of diplomatic personnel and so on. And this was clearly going over the head of this policeman. <clears throat> Fang comes along with his ID, he puts it right here, says, Fang Li Zhe, that's who I am. And what are we gonna do about it? So they had to let us in. And we went in and very quickly, the press figured out where we were because uh, Fang Liger's wife, his, the mother of their son who was back in their apartment, she was worried about him. She called him and said, don't worry, we're in the <clears throat> apartment of this man, David Horley, this Canadian diplomat. Well, the son told the press and the press was ringing the phone off the hook. So Fang, again, very practically said, this is inefficient. Let's go to the Shangri-La Hotel where the international press is and have a news conference. So we went there and there was a news conference and the next day it was all over the world's headlines. The next time I met him, <clears throat> well not the next time, but the next politically relevant time was uh, June 4th, 1989 when this spectacular Beijing massacre happened. My wife woke me up and said the massacre we've been fearing has happened and I hopped on my hopped on my bike as I did before. And I went around to a number of Chinese intellectuals, friends of mine who, who lived nearby to just say, ask what's your view and what's going on. And got to his place about noon and his wife opened the door and she's just quivering with anger. They've gone crazy. I walk in, he was sitting sort of looking like that. He was sitting at his desk very calm and his, his view was, I didn't break the law. There's no reason under human rights principles that I should have to leave home. So I'm not, I'm gonna stay here. So I left and I said to Li Xuxian, his wife, that if you need any help that I can help with, let me know. And she said, if we need help, I will call and invite your children over for tea. I had a three-year-old and a seven-year-old uh, at the time. And sure enough, late in the afternoon, call comes, can uh, Monica and Nathan come over for tea? And so I got a car, by luck I could find a taxi, picked them up and brought them to the Shangri-La Hotel. That was Sunday night, so there was no other, there was no option of going to the U.S. Embassy then. That was what was in the backs of their mind. But the next day I went down and got them some croissants for breakfast and CNN had on the, on the, on the, on the TV tanks parading back and forth in the square and there were these reports of shootings and there still was gunfire around the city. So she, the spouse, uh, convinced him, let's go. And that meant go to the embassy and we went and I helped them get another car and we went across the city and talked for about two and a half hours in the afternoon with two high-ranking U.S. diplomats about what to do. The main dilemma being that if they stayed, no one could say how long the stay would be. They were told, told stories about nuns in Romania who were stuck in the U.S. Embassy for 15 years and stuff like that. Uh, and that if it were known that they were there, it would be grounds on which the government could attack the the student demonstrators for being tools of the American. Look, their main inspiration, this Fang Liger, has been uh, handled by the Americans and he's in the embassy now. So for those reasons, he decided at the end of the day, no, I'm gonna leave, we are all gonna leave, and he and his wife and their younger son, who was with us at the time, all went. So I found them another hotel room at the uh, Jian Guo Fan Dian that was nearby and left them there about eight o'clock and went home to my family. And I didn't see them for another 13 months. Later I learned what happened was the US diplomats had cabled Washington and HW and the Security Council had had an emergency meeting and judged that 
this is second hand now. This, I'm not telling first hand story now, so don't quote me literally. But it was, it's clear to me that the judgment was, if it were known that Fang Liju and Li Xuxian came into the embassy and then were allowed to leave and then were imprisoned for 25 years or even worse, that would be bad, so bring them back. And they sent the same two diplomats back and they uh, invited them to be personal guests of our president and stay, to stay, <coughs> excuse me, to stay as long as you'd like to stay. And they did. All along, she, by the way, was pushing for that result. She genuinely feared for her husband's life. Uh, about two weeks before all of this happened, a friend of theirs who's very high in the government had warned them that in the councils about what to do about the Fang Lijie problem, that one of the alternatives was to have a car accident. And she was, so she literally feared for his life. Uh, now, that's my storytelling part of my talk tonight. <clears throat> the next part uh, will be to introduce this book. Uh, it's out on a cabin, uh, table in the back. And later, if you want to go get one, you may, and I'll be happy to sign it. I want to say right away that uh, I translated this. This is his autobiography, but I have no financial interest in this book. Henry Holt paid me a flat fee to translate it, and so it's a great book, and uh, I really think you'd love to read it, but um, I'm not selling it, okay? Um, <clears throat> I was surprised when I saw the Chinese version of this book. He wrote it during the 13 months that he and his spouse were stuck in the embassy after this dramatic event. Uh, they had a computer. He wrote a couple of astrophysics papers during that time, but also took the time to write this book. Uh, his wife told me later that he did it by conceiving about two episodes per chapter thinking about it, and then just writing it out. And I think he probably did. To, he wrote it quickly, after all. And what is astounding to me, among other things, is that uh, his memory is so good. He names dates and places, and as his translator editor, I go back and check everything I can. I found a half a dozen small mistakes that I corrected for him, but it's still astounding that he could remember so well. What else is astounding to me, <clears throat> and I hope there are no physicists in the room, it astounded me that a physicist could write so gracefully. He really, <laughs> it's really a very beautifully written book, and it, it, was a, it, it was a challenge to me to try to keep up with his, um, his literary abilities. I'm just going to mention two aspects of his literary ability before I go into analysis. One is he's witty. He's charmingly witty. For example, when he's writing about this event I just told you about going to the Bush banquet, getting stopped by police, getting pulled out of the car by um, <clears throat> plainclothes police and told that your names aren't on the invitation list so you can't come and being, you know, he writes it this way. <clears throat> After only a few steps, however, a bevy of plainclothes police surrounded us to block the way. Their leader was a swarthy man with a rough manner, the very image of the kind of hit man whom the police train. He stepped forward, hooked his arm roughly under mine, and said, I am the special agent in charge of all security for the Bush visit. The invitation list that the US Secret Service gave to us does not include your two names, so you cannot go to the banquet." Quotes him, and then Fang writes, <clears throat> this told us several things. For one, it showed that the highest priority of the highest ranking agent in charge of security for the US president was not the security of the US president. <laughs> now I'm gonna give you an example of his graceful lyrical style, sometimes almost mystical, uh, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution years, his wife and he went off to the Huangshan Mountains in Anhui, Anhui province, a beautiful spot. They'd never been able to have a honeymoon before, and so they grabbed this chance. And they hiked to the top of a mountain called Capital Peak. And he writes this. 
The top is like a small island that juts out towards space. Hold it, <coughs> excuse me, juts out towards space, holding its own, bucking and tossing among the clouds that billow one moment and disperse the next as they blow by. The air is thin, the wind chilly. This is the frontier of the secular world, the edge where the cacophony of human voices and hates melts away. It reminded me of the paradiso section of the divine comedy, where the highest level in heaven is occupied not even by God, but only by Dante, his lover Beatrice, and their limitless joy. Every now and then his prose just you know, soars like that. Uh, <clears throat> Other than that, and I can't use time to give all details for this, uh, but it's a wonderful history of modern China because he has a, a scientist's ability to observe and describe objectively. Uh, there's no preaching and no self-pity. You know, most Chinese intellectuals who write about how they were persecuted during the Cultural Revolution fall into preaching and self-pity very easily. He doesn't at all. And he tells us how water was delivered in pre-modern Beijing, how pranksters in his school under Japanese occupation had fun with the Japanese teachers. He tells us about working on farms and in coal mines and a brick factory where he was sent for labor during the Cultural Revolution. He tells us, again, without any pomp, about his debates with top leaders. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> so, I've recommended this book to several of my colleagues who teach modern Chinese history. I think it's a great, a great source for modern Chinese social history. But now I'm going to come to the analytic part of my talk. Um, does science imply human rights? For him it does, and that's my theme tonight. Uh, most Chinese intellectuals over the last hundred years who have grabbed onto the from the West kind of ideas about human rights and democracy and so on, have based themselves in humanist thinkers. John Locke, John Stuart Mill, <clears throat> the declarations in the rights about human rights in the French and the American uh, revolutions. And about 100 years ago, the great May 4th movement in China that was modern China's first sort of efflorescence toward the outside world in pursuit of science and democracy. Uh, he didn't read those writers very much either. Probably some of you in the room know about Hu Shi and Luo Longji, great May 4th era thinkers about democracy and human rights. Fang doesn't talk about them particularly. He doesn't dislike them. But he came to democracy and human rights because of science. In that sense, he's sort of like Andrei Sakharov, and he's been called China's Sakharov. Both were physicists. Both were recruited to work on their country's A-bombs. Both discovered universal human rights partly or mainly through science. Both were persecuted by the regimes they had served because of their advocacy of human rights. And both were sent to exile internal exile in Sakharov's case and external in Fang's. And they were in touch. Even two months after Fang went into the embassy in, 1990, in 1989, his diary entry notes when he got a letter from Sakharov. Sakharov died later that year, as you may know. Uh, in the book at the beginning, Fang explains his infancy. He was sick as an infant, he almost died. And he was always a physically weak little boy. And he went to first grade two years earlier than normal, not because he was precocious, but because his mother didn't, couldn't afford a babysitter and had younger siblings she had to take care of, so shipped him off to elementary school and he almost flunked the first couple of years of elementary school until he caught up. And he describes himself Selves as very guai, perfect word in Chinese, hard to say in English, docile, obedient, nice, unoffending, a rule follower, he says. And then when he went to high school and started to understand the wider world and politics, he was strongly attracted 
to the communist movement, mainly because he, and this was true of a lot of Chinese intellectuals at the time, certainly the ones in his cohort, they were angry at the KMT, the Kuomintang government, for its corruption and its failure to resist Japan adequately and its general incompetence. So he joined the communist underground in 1948 at a time when it was dangerous to do so. I mean, when he joined, you could be executed if you were caught. Uh, and he describes a night in the summer of 1948 in Beijing. He went out to a outdoor um, athletic field where Mao Zedong and the other top communist leaders were gonna come and he'd never seen him and it was raining. And so they stand through the rain, dancing in the rain. And he says the dancing had two purposes. One was to stay warm and the other was they were so happy. We're going to see Chairman Mao and the top leaders, Chairman Mao and Liu Shaoqi and others appeared. So he was well on his way and then when the revolution happened, he counted as a cadre who joined the revolution early because he joined before 1949. And um, in his early years uh, in the 1950s, he got into Beijing University to the physics department, which was his ideal. Uh, and remained an idealistic communist and a, an ardent pursuer of physics. And then he describes a third factor entering, uh, which was his girlfriend, Li Xuxian, who's still living now. She lives in Tucson, Arizona, uh, who was also a communist and also a physicist. So now he says his belief formed a tripod, girlfriend, physics, communism. And each leg of the tripod supported the other two. It was wonderful. And he saw his brilliant future as endless and optimistic. But then, in his college years, problems arose as the physics strut of the tripod and the communism strut of the iPod came into conflict. I'll quote now what he writes about this. Over the ensuing decades, the conflict between them got worse and worse eventually forcing little rule follower me to turn into a so-called troublemaker. Troublemaker is a technical term that the government uses for people who are refractory. So what I'm gonna do now is analyze how he went from science to skepticism about Marxism and then finally to what is called dissidence. He never pursued the label of dissident, but by the time this process ended, that was what fit him best and he accepted it. And I'm gonna analyze it in six steps. Now this is my analysis, not his, but if you read the book, I think you'll, uh, I think you'll agree with my analysis. Um, at Beijing University, in what I'm calling step one, he learns that science begins in skepticism. He writes this, Skepticism is an indispensable starting point in physics. A person who cannot begin in skepticism or who lacks the ability to raise questions independently will never master physics. Physics does not ask you to memorize what is known to be true or false. It teaches you how to find truth for yourself and how to distinguish truth from falsity. Even for the truths handed down from the great physics masters, when it comes your turn to learn them, if you really want to get it, you have to start by doubting, by confronting the same questions yourself and then making your own rediscoveries of the truths. Niels Bohr once pointed out that anyone who was not perplexed when first encountering quantum mechanics is not possibly someone who understands quantum mechanics. And he goes on, in our university courses in Marxism, however, the starting point was very different. We were taught that Marxism is a science, indeed the science of all sciences, yet one of our teachers was fond of saying, the best we can ever do here is to recapitulate Marx with elegance. Something struck me as strange, he writes, science is based in doubt, Yet the science of sciences needs only recapitulation? How can that be? This was the first little crack in my faith that physics 
romance and communism are three in one. <clears throat> step two in my analysis, building from the skepticism step, physics asks for independence of thought and creativity by individuals. In 1955, when he was still a student at, at Beijing University, there was a big nationwide meeting of the Communist Youth League. Uh, and the goal of the meeting of the Youth League was to turn students into three good students. Now, if you're from China, you know what that means. San hao xue sheng means you're good, this is a phrase from Mao Zedong, grades good, body good, spirit good, and spirit meant politics. So if you're good in all three categories, then you're a three good student, and only a very small minority got to be that. He was one. His girlfriend, Li Xuxian, was one. And there were more three good students in his department of physics than any other department, so he was fine by that. But the goal of this conference was to make all students move toward being three good students. And he thought, where does this formula allow for skepticism, for for independence of thought. And he writes this. <clears throat> After one day of the Congress, we were all bored. We were three good students ourselves, but so what? Did that mean everybody else had to be one too? We didn't think so. Why homogenize people? Didn't scientific creativity come from efforts to be distinctive? We decided to revolt. Out with the boredom. To be sure, we, to be sure that we got everybody's attention, we plotted to seize the podium the next day. Uh, the Youth League branch leader was in cahoots with them, so this made it easier to carry out that plot. And the next day, at the proper moment, Fang himself jumped up on the podium and began ad-libbing. And he writes this about his ad-libbing. My first ad-libbing point was that the Congress so far had been deadly dull and needed a much livelier atmosphere. Next, I said the real question we needed to be asking is, what kind of people does the Youth League want us to become? Simple-minded, rule-following bookworms or thinkers with independent minds? Should the Youth League's goal be that of everybody gets all the right answers in every subject or that all young people learn to think for themselves and be distinctive? This and his description made a big hit. All kinds of other students chimed in and also came up to the podium and the place was crazy and the Youth League uh, planners' plans were destroyed. And in the atmosphere, uh, in the afternoon, the chair of the meeting had no real choice except to announce that the agenda for that afternoon would change and the meeting would break into small group discussions of the question, what kind of people should our education seek to produce? And Fon thought, we won. But a week later, all the students who'd been at that convention were called back for a five-hour speech by the party secretary of the university. For those of you who don't study China, party secretary is the top communist official. It's not a secretary position. <clears throat> And the party secretary said, among the five hours of speech, uh, the question, what kind of people should our education produce, needs no further discussion because the party's policy on education has already answered it with perfect clarity. There is no need for, quote, independent thinking, unquote, because Marx, Lenin, Mao, and the Communist Party have already thought so well on behalf of the people that there is no possible way to improve upon it. So this kind of experience led Fang to what I'm gonna call the step three in his evolution, and that's the principle of the equality of thinking minds with other thinking minds in the face of the truth. That is, we think this and the party secretary comes down with that, no. Everybody should be able to think equally uh, before the truth. 
1956, he writes, he read how the German physicist Werner Heisenberg was critical of the fact that Soviet physicists always had to say things like, we are grateful to the thinking of the great leader Lenin, uh, even though Lenin knew nothing about physics, but you had to put that in your article and then write your physics and at the end thank Lenin again. And indeed, during the Cultural Revolution years, Chinese writers, physicists, had to do that for, for Chairman Mao. It was called wearing a hat and wearing boots. You put on the hat and then you do your physics and then you put on the boots. <clears throat> and Fong writes this, Heisenberg's criticisms of Lenin did not completely undo the place of Lenin in my mind. You can see his, his disillusionment from Marxism wasn't overnight. It, it went in descending order, or if you look at it the other way, ascending order, because even after all of that, uh, Lenin had a special place in his mind. Even a saint like Lenin did not have privileged status, he started to think. His words, like anyone's, were subject to science's rules of logic and evidence. If forced to choose between science and non-science, I would have to choose science, no matter how brightly the halos shone on the non-science side. You can't cheat physics. And uh, then he began to realize that many undergraduates among his classmates began that doubt process in the same way. And he writes this about the problems of the party officials in dealing with this skepticism. He writes this, party officials often were genuinely puzzled over why it was that students strayed from orthodox thinking when they went to college. Where did the counter-revolutionary education come from? They tied themselves in knots trying to figure out why students who were carefully selected for good thinking, quote unquote, when they entered universities, turned into bourgeois intellectuals, quote unquote, once they were there. They took out magnifying glasses to examine every detail of campus life, inside and outside classrooms, and asked school administrators to remove anything that came remotely close to counter-revolutionary thinking. But it never worked, and it never can work because what they called counter-revolutionary thinking is stuck inside of science. No course in a physics department is more counter-revolutionary than physics one. No one who understands physics can turn around and accept the claim that Marxism-Leninism is a special wisdom that trumps everything else. <clears throat> Apologies for the verb trumps there, that's not Step four in my analysis is that in order to, serve, to thrive, science needs freedom of expression and freedom of information. And here, Fang's, one of his teachers, was the experience of the Great Leap Famine in the late 1950s, when he'd been sent to the countryside and saw the famine firsthand, and also saw an article by the Chinese physicist Qian Xuesen, who worked on the A-bomb rockets for Mao Zedong's group, and went to Caltech nearby, who wrote an article during the Great Leap Famine upholding Maoist science, which was balderdash in Fang's view. <clears throat> and he notes that this balderdash went uncriticized because all the physicists in China, including him, knew that they could not oppose it in public and would suffer grievously if they tried. Now I'm quoting him directly. <clears throat> Freedom is vital to science. Science dies without it. When Qian Xuesen's ridiculous article came out, Chinese physicists could see it for what it was, but no one had the freedom to say so. Not even purely scientific criticisms were possible because this author, was a favorite of Mao Zedong, and this article's conclusions supported the Great Leap Forward. But the even more baleful act, fact is that the dictator of a mammoth political party could be so benighted and reckless as to use obsequious science, quote unquote, 
to make policies that affected nearly a billion people. How can a country that imprisons science expect anything but disaster? So not only does a nation suffer when science is blocked, science itself suffers because information can't be shared. He has many passages in the book on how physicists internationally do share information all the time. It's a thoroughly international field. <clears throat> he admires Einstein's statement that I am not doing Jewish physics because there is no Jewish physics. And Fang follows up by saying, right, and I'm not doing Chinese physics. <clears throat> Step five, how he was drawn to astrophysics in particular. Early in his career, he worked on the bomb. He was into particle physics, and then he worked on lasers for a while. But he turned to astrophysics. At the height of the Cultural Revolution, he was sent down to a place in Anhui called Bagongshan, Bagong Mountain. <laughs> Uh, to a coal mine and went down his wonderful descriptions of uh, underneath in the coal mine. On the surface, there were political campaigns on the surface of the earth, I mean, and people committing suicide when they were the victims of the political campaigns. And part of his work after getting out of the mine was to pull carts, these you know, rickshaws really, but not for people, for, for goods. So he went around pulling carts, and one of the things he had to pull were corpses. There was a malaria uh, epidemic, and people died of malaria. So he had to bring the corpses to the morgue, and he did. And one night he noticed a group of students whom he recognized who were guarding the gates to the morgue 24 hours a day, and he wondered, what's going on here? And it turns out there were wild dogs who would hide in the bushes, and the wild dogs would come out and push the doors of the morgue open and lick the blood of the victims and maybe even eat it. So their classmates, the friends, were guarding to make sure the wild dogs couldn't do that. Here again, you know, how awful the descriptions are. He never loses his scientific objectivity. He doesn't tell you to detest these facts. He just lets you read them. At the same time, he ran across a book called Classical Theory of Fields by Lev Landau. It was the only book he had, but luckily it was on physics, and he hid under his mosquito net at night and read it, and quotes from it Henri Poincaré saying, if nature were not beautiful, we would, it would not be worth knowing, and if nature were not worth knowing, Life would not be worth living. And then he comments at the end of this chapter, yes, the universe was beautiful and worth knowing too. There was a reason for me to keep on living after all. I had found a new starting point. Bagong Mountain with its 102 degree temperatures, its mosquitoes and malaria, its political campaigns and its suicides, its dead bodies and wild... <coughs> and wild dogs, no matter how squalid, ugly, and tyrannical, could not touch the beauty that arose from my wonder and awe at the colossal thing called the universe. <laughs> that beauty now owned me. And that's the end of that chapter. <clears throat> step six, which is my final step here, is how he came to, from all of this, to universal values, be they scientific or in human rights or in uh, other things. Uh, the overarching grandeur of the universe led him to believe that truths are universal. They do not change with the political borderlines that human beings set up. Uh, in 1986, he writes this. Uh, about 1986, he writes this. I went to Stockholm for the 11th conference of the International Society on General Relativity and Gravitation. And when the meeting was over, I went up, I went up to a little town in northern Sweden called Kiruna to see what the midnight sun was like. Like most people living on most parts of the earth, I was accustomed to the alternations by which it is always either day or night and either a warm season or a cool one. So my first impression of the Arctic was that everything had gone haywire. 
A day did not divide into light and dark hours, and all four seasons were present at once. The flowers of spring, the long days of summer, the layered clouds of autumn, and the cold, and the cold of winter all shared a stage. The normal borderlines had been erased. Around the same time, he got a letter from a friend in Beijing who wrote this, culture fever has arisen in China. In the late 80s, there was this culture fever that was wondering whether there's something wrong with our fundamental culture and should we root ourselves in a Western or a different culture? And it was a big debate, and this friend wrote him about this. Uh, the letter goes on, people were debating whether China's reforms should be based in Chinese culture or be an explicit step into Western culture. The premise of the debate seemed to me the same as the day or night pattern that most people live within. It had to be either light outside or dark outside, one or the other. The friend who sent me the letter wanted me to express an opinion on it, wanted him to say, go Western, no doubt, um, wanted me to express an opinion on it, but I did not reply to the letter. We scientists like to focus on questions of truth versus error, or more advanced versus less advanced understanding. We very seldom raise questions of East versus West. At the Earth's poles, in fact, the very concepts of North, South, East, and West are useless. So why do we have to worry so much about Easternness? As I watched the ever-circling sun in the sky over Kiruna, this is still Fang speaking, it suddenly dawned on me how I could reply to my friend. What China needs is precisely to get away from confining questions like East versus West. Our reform should be open in all directions. We should welcome anything that is good not asking whether it is East or West. This was the origin of what the Communist Party authorities later called my bourgeois liberal thinking, which was in their view, which in their view did so much to disturb, disturb peace in China. Okay, those are my six steps. The last comments I'll make is are how to evaluate him in general? This is a very tough question for me because when he died in April of 2012, I went over to Tucson where the funeral was and they asked me to speak and asked me as a sinologist to address this question of what difference did he, does he make, did he make? Uh, and I'll, I put it this way, that the first time I lived for any length of time in China it was 1979-80, right when Democracy Wall had happened. And I can remember looking at posters on lamp posts at that time that used the phrase Ren Chuan, human rights. Uh, but the atmosphere about that was extremely radioactive, you might say. That's a very dangerous term. Most people stayed away from it or looked at it from a distance. What is this Chuan idea of ordinary people's Chuan? Now, if you go to China, this notion of Chuan, not necessarily with the Ren part there, but still the idea of rights has spread all over the place. Ordinary workers or retirees whose pensions are running out or even farmers in rural Guangdong who get mistreated say, we have Chuan and we're going to demonstrate for it. And they block roads or they'll go on strike saying Chuan. So over that span from about 1980 till now, how many years is that, 35 or 40 years, that term became far less radioactive and now is endemic everywhere, right? Of course. Many, many people and many, many kinds of activities cause that difference. You can't say any one person, be ridiculous to say any one person did it, but if you ask, if you ask which one person did the most, I said I thought this guy had done the most. He's different from other Chinese intellectuals in that he had a conceptual breakthrough to uh, this universal level. 
that I talked about at the end, this view from Kiruna, as it were. Uh, I have a lot of other friends who are Chinese intellectuals, and I must say, although I sympathize with them entirely, their usual way of arguing is to sort of turn the tables, and you're saying this about us, well, we're going to say that about you. And if you will, the mode of fighting is the same, even though you know, we're right and you're wrong, and they're very courageous to stand up and talk back to the authoritarian government. But Fong doesn't. He doesn't argue back in the terms that the government argues to him with. He goes up here. And you know, who knows how long and what the long-term value of that transcendence is going to be. I asked this question to uh, my own teacher, a retired professor at Princeton named Yu Shi, who is one of the world's best living Chinese historians. How would you evaluate Fang? Because now, you know, if you go to China now and you ask young people, most of them haven't heard of him. Right from 89, his name is blocked from any mention in the press at all. Even scientific papers, he usually has to use a, a, a pseudonym in order to get them into China. So the younger generation hasn't heard of him at all. And the middle generation who remember him, he's got a core of loyal following among scientists, but others, you know, they turn their attention elsewhere and, because you're not allowed to talk about his legacy in public. He's very dangerous too. So he's not uh, nearly as prominent as he would have been if he could have stayed inside China. Uh, and that raises the question of, is that the end? Is he just going to dribble off into uh, oblivion in history? And I asked this of Yu Shi, and he said not necessarily, and he gave me the parallel to this May 4th intellectual that I talked about, what, half an hour ago, Hu Shi, who was a leading advocate of things like democracy and human rights in the late teens and the early 20s. And then when you get to the Mao revolution in the 50s and 60s, he too was obliterated. Not mentioned at all, or if he was mentioned, he was an evil bourgeois liberal who tried to lead China astray and so on. But now, starting in about the 90s, and now he's made a huge comeback. Hu Shi has his reputation in China is very, very rosy now. It's sort of like a bounce effect. He's pushed underneath, but then when he can come back, uh, comes back even with a stronger reputation than he had back in the early 1920s. And Yu Shi made the speculation, not the prediction, but the possibility that the same might happen to Fang Lijer because of that Transcend, excuse me, that transcendent kind of breakthrough intellectually that he was able to accomplish. Now, I don't have my watch in front of me. I've probably gone over time. It's, uh, what? We can stop now and take questions, or I can talk about other things, but that's what I wanted to say that much. Mm. Mm. We'll now take questions. If you have questions for Professor Link, um, please wait for Michael or I to come to you with a microphone. As always, priority goes to students. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I had one question um, just relating to the overarching theme of the talk. Um, so right there at the end, uh, step six, you said, uh, he, he said we should choose anything that's good regardless of whether it's east or west. Right. Um, but I can see how that, that, that leads you to the, the universality or the universal openness. Um, but what is, what's good on his conception? And so why does that have to include human rights? Because I, I just don't see that final link to human rights. I just see sort of universality. Thank you. Hmm. I suppose it could be argued that repression of human rights is a universal good, if that's what your conscience tells you. I think to him it's, it's obvious that human rights are good, if by human rights you mean being able to 
say what you actually think and control your own life and meet with the people you like to meet with and these other, well, of course, the right to food, clothing, and shelter and so on. Uh, why would you think human rights wouldn't be a universal ideal? I guess just to, to clarify, I mean, it, so, so you, you would get to a certain conception of um, something that's universally good, but it's, is it just intuition that leads us to think that what's good is these, these things that we take to understand as human rights? So is it just based on that mm. intuition that, oh, it's obvious that goodness is these sort of human rights, or is, it is, is there some further uh, causal connection? No, I think he would argue, in fact, I know he would argue that democracy as a political system is more scientific the way he conceives it than authoritarianism is because it's more efficient in bringing about what most people in society re regard as goods like food, clothing, shelter, health, and so on. Uh, for example, in this great leap forward famine that I told you briefly about, where he notes that not only scientists, but the farmers well knew that these crackpot Maoist theories that said plant the rice very close together because it's a bourgeois liberal theory that says you can't do that. The farmers knew you have to leave a space between them. The farmers couldn't speak out because they'd, they'd be punished too. So in that situation, if there were human rights for the farmers, the famine wouldn't have happened because they could have said, nonsense, the plants will die if you do that. So I, I see your question now, and I, it's a good question. I, he, he thinks that <clears throat> on scientific efficiency grounds, democracy brings about what human beings regard as goods more efficiently than authoritarians. So often in the press you hear the opposite argument, especially in the mainland Chinese press, that authoritarians can get things done, right? We're going to build a railroad, a high-speed railroad, and we can just raise things and build the railroad, and that's more efficient. And it is, right? Democracies are slow and messy. You have to go through hearings, and you have to vote, and you have to look for funds. But the problem, Fang would say, I'm pretty sure, is that the authoritarians, when they get it right, that's fine. If they get it wrong, it's a disaster. And democracy, human rights, is the mechanism that could prevent those disastrous mistakes. Hello. Um, we met in class on Tuesday. My name's Kelsey. Hello, Hi. Professor Bolton's yeah. class. Um, so we read a piece, I want to say it was in Orville Schell's book, or we had a PDF, and he, Fong, was, um, sorry, I'm getting there. Um, he was, um, I'm nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. I am nervous. Okay, if you're so, nervous, think what I am. So, okay, so it seems like he was upset because he had a lot of skin in the game, and he was having to report to like party officials about physics to non-physicists is kind of the gist that I was getting from one of his speeches that was like either on the democracy wall or one of those things. And I was just kind of wondering how much skin in the game do you have to have to be a distant? Like he was, like this was his profession, he was an astrophysicist. Like I can only imagine how irritating it is to have to report to a non-physicist about your findings. So yeah. I just kind of was wondering if you could talk about being a political distant and like how much, like how much opposition you have to have in order to get to that place where you're advocating for a whole group of people? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, my feeling about why dissidents become dissidents is that they're oddballs. I, I rankle when people suggest that dissidents are way out on the fringes they're not on the fringes politically half the time. Fong's advocacy all through the 80s, if you read the book, it's obvious, was not out of the mainstream of what intellectuals were thinking. It was right in the mainstream. But the difference was he was willing to risk and put his own head on the chopping block and, and, 
and, and, and go for it. So skin in the game, almost always it's just idealism. It's, all right, I'm gonna take this risk because I think it's the right thing to do. All you other guys can watch and applaud me when I go and run the flag up the pole. It's a very common phenomenon, not just for him, but for Chinese dissidents generally. But to turn it around, every now and then you'll find a dissident who is knocked into that status because of what you'd call skin in the game. And here I think of the head of the Tiananmen Mothers, Ding Zilin, who was a professor of philosophy at Renmin University and a party member and not a dissident at all until her son on the night of June 4th was shot and killed. And that sort of instantaneously, that skin in the game, there's blood and bones in the game there, uh, turned her from a very much inside the system to a, somebody who devoted the rest of her life to being a dissident. Does that help? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> in order to like not necessarily act out, but speak out or do something, or like right. can things be kind of moderate and you have a problem with it, and can you then be successful as a dissident? Yeah, that's a good question because in the book there's a very interesting answer to that. Uh, he in the 1980s could go abroad a few times, and in 1980, gee, I can't. I think it was 1986. Yes, he came to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton and spent a pleasant time there and he's got some charming lyrical writing about watching the deer eating grass at the edge of the, of the Institute Woods as it's called and how he could spend all day on physics and talk with his friends about physics and life was almost too good and then this is a sign of his honesty, too. He says, at another level, I started to want to go back to China because I wanted an opposition. It's not that blunt, but the idea is I didn't feel I was achieving what I could achieve when things are too easy to do. Now, that doesn't mean that he preferred politics to physics. That was never the case. And when he came out of the embassy and went to England and then to Princeton in 1990, a lot of people in the overseas Chinese dissident movement scolded him for not stepping forward and being our great leader. They were hoping he would do that and expecting. He didn't. He applied for physics jobs and went to the University of Arizona to be an astrophysicist and they thought, boy, you're a chicken. But he wasn't a chicken. That was a basic misreading of him. He, all his life, was first a physicist and then saw it as his citizen's duty to do these other things. But your question is interesting because when the citizen's duties were too easy, he wasn't satisfied either. He wanted to go back to China in order to push, not just to push political human rights and democracy, but to push the democratization of the field of physics. Hmm. Thank you for sharing uh, some Chinese stories with us. And uh, my question is, uh, do you think Chinese government is able to, or uh, is willing to make progress in protecting- Make what? Progress uh -huh. uh, in protecting human rights in China. Because I know, I strongly agree to uh, your opinion about uh, the, the phenomenon in China. So my question is uh, whether the government will, or uh, is willing to make progress in protecting uh, human rights in China. In the well, of course, the Chinese government always says that it's working to protect uh, human rights. And in general, there's a bifurcation between uh, welfare kinds of human rights, food, clothing, shelter, disease, longevity. And there, I mean, the record's clear that the Chinese populace is living longer and on average has more income. and. And that. But then the other part, the, the civil and political rights, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom to publish, and so on, um, no, is my short answer. I don't think that the Communist Party of China 
can do that. And it's not because in theory they're against it. It's in the Chinese constitution that freedom of expression, freedom of assembly is there. So at the level of pretense, yes, they recognize that that's a good idea. But I don't think they can do it because the fundamental concern of the Communist Party of China ever since the 1940s when they were fighting Japan has been how to maintain the power of the Communist Party of China. And fighting the Japanese was one way to organize and get the better of the, of the Kuomintang. In the 50s, the idealism of the Chinese people, we I mean fool, serve the people, you know, really caught on and people wanted to do that and the so-called what political scientists call legitimacy of the party was making that kind, working toward a better society, almost a utopia. In fact, there was a time Mao was sort of promising a utopia. Then the utopia crashed with the Great Leap Famine and the Cultural Revolution. So starting in the 1980s, Deng Xiaoping had this make money, turn outward, let people travel again, and then make money. And that accelerated after the Beijing massacre. Make money. So everybody wants to make money and goes crazy over it. Money becomes the overwhelming public value in China. But why does the party want to do that? They want to do it because that's the latest way to support the power of the party. If the people are happy about making money, they're going to support us. Now, I think we're seeing a very interesting turn now because the Chinese economy is slowing down, as we all know. Wages have ridden, risen to where it's no longer that advantageous for Chinese capitalists and international capitalists to exploit cheap labor and make money. So China needs to have what is called you know, the soft landing and convert the economy. But can it do that? This is dangerous and iffy now. So now I think with Xi Jinping, you're seeing a real push towards nationalism. You know, being provocative in the South China Sea and making, sending Confucius Institutes around the world and really stressing nationalism. In my view, the reason for doing that is that nationalism now becomes the leading edge issue for garnering support for the party. So, I, it, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that the Communist Party of China would ever make human rights and democracy of the civil kind a higher priority than keeping its own power. Hi, Professor. Thanks so much for coming. So my question is actually in that vein because that is has been one of the issues of China is this kind of struggle between do we focus on GDP or do we focus on the environment? So yeah. now that the GDP is kind of slowing down a little bit, um, do you, I mean, and even before that, do you foresee environmental scientists um, facing any sort of threat or having any sort of um, seeing any sort of backlash from the CCP for kind of criticizing Beijing, Harbin, Shanghai for having massive pollution rates that end up um, keeping, their, keeping their citizens from even going outside and they're risking their health just right. by living in these places. Right, right, right. Um, the environmental problem is especially air pollution and water pollution I think the central government knows about it and would try to solve that if it could. And there are a lot of good scientists in the Environmental Protection Agency in China who are doing their best on these kinds of things. Here I don't see the central government's obsession with keeping its power as the main problem. Here I see in the provinces and local areas, you've got local people figuring out uh, entrepreneurs, capitalists, how to run coal mines and factories that pollute and dump the wastewater in the ocean. And I don't think the central government likes that and would control it, and they would control it if they could. But the, <laughs> the urge to make money in the provinces is so strong that it takes over and can't be easily controlled from the top. I think. Yeah. Hello, Professor. Uh, I want to first thank you for your talk. 
Uh, my question is, uh, so you mentioned earlier in your talk of the um, dissident before Fang who was expelled from the country and then saw a resurgence, the May 4th uh, dissident. Pardon, say that again, they, b before Fang? Yeah. yeah, the May 4th dissident um, who yeah. was silenced and then managed to come right, back. Right, right, Hu I was talking yes. about, yeah. Ah, and so you, and the uh, teacher of yours who thought that Fang would have a similar uh, reaction yeah. of coming back. Right. So my question is, do you think that the Communist Party in China is ever going to learn the lesson of that banning people only means they come back stronger, uh, or that they'll, just, they'll stop that, or that they'll just keep on the same uh, tactics? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, empirically speaking, you'd have to say that most of the people whom the Communist Party has slammed down haven't bounced back. In this sense, Hu Shi, because of the power of his intellectual uh, contributions, was able to bounce back, and maybe Fang can too. I think of Liu Binyan, who is another well-known Chinese dissident, died a few years ago in, in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, exiled ever since the Beijing massacre, who, again, like Fang, wasn't known ever since he was exiled. The younger generation didn't, doesn't know about him. But in the 1980s, when he was at the top of his popularity, he was arguably the most beloved Chinese writer. And that's not just my ex uh, guess, that in 1985, the uh, Chinese Writers Association, which was always controlled by the party and still is, for the first and only time, was allowed to do a free election of who its president and vice president would be. And this man, Liu Binyan, was number two. Number one was Ba Jin, who was a famous writer from the 30s, but who also, in the 80s, had published a little book denouncing the Cultural Revolution. So he, too, had a wellspring of, you know, sort of anti-Maoism in him. And Liu Binyan wrote about corruption. He, he rooted for the little people. He was for ground-up democracy. And he wrote about corruption and bullying and things like that. Uh, he was expelled from the Communist Party in January of 1987 in the very same movement that, that knocked Fang out. So they knew each other and stuff. But Liu Binyan has not had a bounce back. And if I had to guess, I think Yu Yingshi is right that Fang has a better chance of bouncing back because of this transcendent nature of his intellectual contribution. Liu Binyan was very, very smart and extremely well informed and very analytical. I don't mean anything like that. But he didn't, he still was in the Marxist hyphen Maoist mode of argumentation just on the other side. Uh, there we go. So thank you very much again for the talk. Uh, one of the things that I was wondering about is the way that you described the Chinese education system seems to be it's dying, uh, somewhat anti-intellectual and this kind of discouragement of free thought and like overly yeah. creative thinking. And I think on a vein of what you were talking about earlier with economic development, it seems that mm -hmm. up until now they've been able to grow very strongly mm -hmm. in an industrial sense of factories and right. things like that. But as mm -hmm. they enter a kind of more developed right. stage, right. they start competing against developed economies and service-based right. economies right. where those sorts of skills are considered extremely valuable. Right. So then my question is, is, is there a way that the government is trying to reconcile being more competitive in those more kind of creative economic yeah. avenues, or are they right. trying to build their own version of an economy where that's not required? Well, first of all, let me compliment you on your analysis. I think that's exactly right. The catch-up mode that has made China so rich so quickly has been using technology that's already known, and now, the question of can we break through to a kind of economy where innovation, research and development, is the leading edge of it. And I'm sure the dilemma for the educators in China is how to encourage scientific free, th free thinking that can be applied to industry and not encourage 
free thinking in other ways. And if you take Mr. Fong's experience, I'm pessimistic that they can make that divide clear. I mean, how can you really go to a smart young Chinese and say, think like crazy in the areas of STEM fields, but religion, politics, history, ideology, morality, whoop, here's the right answer. It's hard. <laughs> I do think that's still a problem in Chinese education, though, of the teaching everything that's technical very, very well to a very high level, but not encouraging independence of thought. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions this evening. Please join me in thanking Professor Perry Lin. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>